Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk today about how EPA is going to implement the Biden climate agenda uh, via air quality. Um, you may recall, oh, what is it, 12 years ago, uh, the Obama administration tried to legislate uh, climate via the Waxman Markey cap and trade bill that failed, and EPA fell back on. Or I'm sorry, the, the Obama administration fell back on EPA to regulate climate, and they issued a series of rules, all justified or based on uh, air quality regulations, which uh, wiped out 94 percent of the market value of the coal industry. All the uh, major coal companies went into bankruptcy, and uh, uh, you know the reason we rely so much on natural gas today is because of all that. Okay, so we ha we're facing a similar scenario today. Um, if you were at my talk yesterday, you heard me um, describe the uh, Clean Electricity Performance Program, which is the heart and soul of the current Biden climate legislative agenda. Uh, it is in the three and a half trillion or five and a half trillion or you know gazillion dollar stimulus spending orgy that is being considered in Congress right now. Um, it's this uh, Rube Goldberg scheme of paying and penalizing utilities to move to wind and solar and away from fossil fuels. Uh, by 2030, we would go from a situation where we're 10% wind and solar now and 60% fossil fuels to 10% fossil fuels and 60% wind and solar. Um, you know, the grid, to replace the grid today would cost uh, $5 trillion at least. Uh, if 60% of that is fossil fuels and just assuming all, all uh, fuel sources cost the same just for the sake of argument and simplicity, you're looking at $3 trillion worth of, worth of fossil fuel infrastructure. But the Clean Electricity uh, Performance Program only provides $223 billion to do that. Now, how can you replace a $3 trillion system with $223 billion? Well, it's obviously not a serious plan, right? The purpose of the plan is to federalize the grid, not to actually get to 60% wind and solar, not that that would work anyway. So uh, it's hard to believe this would go anywhere in Congress, and it's been a kind of a close run thing, but uh, yesterday the New York Times reported that Joe Manchin uh, has come out against this, so it, and the White House is working on alternatives, taking out the Clean Electricity Performance Program from the stimulus program, so it looks like this part is dead. So what's EPA going to do? Well, they're going to go back, or what's the Biden administration going to do? Well, they're going to go back to the playbook, who was uh, implemented by this woman, Gina McCarthy, who during the Obama administration, she was EPA administrator. Um, and uh, now she is the White House climate czar. Uh, but I refer to her more as the uh, White House climate furor. I see no reason to, you know, crit to, to slam the Romanovs <laughs> because of their birth. Uh, and so she has said, if you look at that last quote there, rest assured we are moving forward with regulations. So it's not enough to stop this in Congress. We must work on EPA. So how will they do this? Well, so you know, I was part of the Trump uh, EPA transition team. We read out some plans, rules that had to be re uh, reversed. And a lot of it uh, got done, not maybe as well as we'd like it to, uh, because that's politics. But some of the rules that the Trump administration uh, reversed was uh, the methane rule, which would require companies to fix methane leaks, the Clean Power Plan, which was intended to cut CO2 emissions from power plants. Um, Trump rolled back the Obama fuel economy standards, which were unrealistic, nobody was meeting. And this is not really a climate rule, but it was a, it's a major EPA rule, waters of the United States, which is used for land grabs. And now the Biden administration has uh, launched uh, processes to, you know, resurrect these things. So they're all coming back to their Obama or worse standards. Now EPA's most important powers uh, are in its, or its most powerful powers <laughs> are in its national ambient air quality standards. And in particular, uh, those for ozone, uh, I'm talking about ground level smog uh, versus, you know, stratospheric ozone, uh, and fine particulate matter. And fine particulate matter is actually more important than ozone because the ozone standards are often based on reductions in fine particulate matter. And I have this fetish for fine particulate matter. I seem to be the only person who really cares about this. Uh, I have spent quite a bit of time on it. Um, and we'll talk about that. 
So uh, the reason that NACs are so important is because in the Clean Air Act, um, these standards, these national ambient air quality standards, have to be set uh, at, a, at a level that is safe, so that the air is safe for the public, and then not only safe, but then you have to have an adequate margin of safety. Uh, so they're, they're, they're more than safe. And cost is not a consideration when you're setting these standards. Okay, cost is not a consideration. Um, if states do not comply, then EPA can punish them. Okay? And uh, part of that punishment can include basically EPA control over state economy, state development, roads, uh, you know, factories, industrial development, everything. And so what's going on right now is, um, we'll talk about this, uh, the, the EPA is tightening the PM 2.5 standards. So what's PM 2.5? Well, PM 2.5 is dust and soot. Uh, PM 2.5 comes out of automobile tailpipes, out of smokestacks. It's forest fires, comes out of barbecue pits, uh, comes uh, out of, you know, from smoking. Uh, PM 2.5, since it's also sort of dust-like particles, can also be pollen, mold, uh, all, all sorts of things. Any sort of dust and soot um, is PM 2.5. Uh, and just, uh, just so you know, uh, during the Obama, I want to mention these rules that the uh, Obama administration used against the coal industry. Uh, they lowered the PM 2.5 national air quality standards, and they used PM 2.5 in these three rules, cross-state air pollution rule, mercury air transport standard, and the clean power plan, all of which forced utilities out of coal uh, and into natural gas. So it's a very, very potent regulatory weapon. Now the thing with, with PM 2.5 is that EPA claims that, uh, well based, based on EPA science, um, people now say that eight million people die every year from inhaling particulate matter. That's about one in seven deaths in the world. And in America, EPA believes that um, uh, PM 2.5 kills about almost, well, one in five. 570,000 deaths a year caused by PM 2.5. Just dust in the air. Um, now, on the right is a book I did in 2016, which has been my, you know, fetish on PM 2.5, my personal investigation and activism on PM 2.5, and I explain why EPA is full of crap. No one dies from PM 2.5. No one's health is even affected by PM 2.5. Um, and, uh, you know, during the Trump administration, well, we'll get to that. So, you know, I, I first started, when I really started first focusing on PM 2.5 at the end of uh, the 2000s, um, you know, I issued this challenge for EPA. I mean, EPA says that hundreds of thousands of people die every year from PM 2.1. Well, show me a body. Okay? If all these people, if one in seven people in the world die from, PM 2. from inhaling PM 2.5, show me. Show me the body. And, of course, ten years later, they've, you know, not been able to do that. Um, in my book, Scare Pollution, um, I put forth a hypothesis of explaining past instances of... Um, lethal air pollution. There have been some. In 1930 in Belgium, in the Meuse Valley, uh, there was a, an episode where air pollution killed, uh, I think, you know, about, a, about 100 people. Uh, in 1948 in Donora, Pennsylvania, De, uh, Donora's in a valley, um, 20 people were killed by an air pollution incident. Uh, incident. And then in London in 1952, uh, and this is less clear, but arguably people were, uh, you know, people were killed by the great London fog. And so my hypothesis is that, and I went back and researched all, you know, what people said at the time about what they thought was going on. Um, you know, EPA reviews these inc incidents and says, oh, this was PM 2.5. But if you go back and actually read the literature and then think about it and do other research, you find out that the problem, all these air pollution incidents are the same. You have um, a temperature inversion where the air gets trapped. And then you have uh, people don't shut down their smokestacks, and you have all these acidic gases that are going into the air. They get concentrated, and some people fall victim to that. Now, on, on, you know, I, sort of a sad story, but um, something that re happened recently that validates my theory versus, you know, EPA has, they say 8 million people are killed by PM 2.5. They have no bodies. Um, 
This man in Wisconsin here is a farmer who died mysteriously. Uh, Wisconsin state authorities um, investigated, and what they came, the conclusion they came to is that he was a victim of an air inversion. He was working on his dairy farm somehow. Uh, sulfur, sulfur gases got concentrated over him, and uh, he died. So uh, bad for him, uh, good for my hypothesis. And, and that, that's important because EPA has no bodies to support what it's claiming, and it's going to use its bogus theory um, to regulate climate. Now, um, one of the great things we were able to do at, uh, you know, during the Trump years is we were able to get the EPA outside science advisory boards back on track on PM 2.5. When, when EPA first started regulating PM 2.5 in the mid-90s, its outside uh, science advisory board for air quality is called CASAC. CASAC ruled that EPA had no evidence that PM 2.5 killed anybody. Uh, the Clinton EPA <coughs> administrator, Carol Browner, since she's not required by law to fo follow their advice, she went and regulated anyway. And then since the Clinton administration has just gotten progressively worse in the Obama uh, administration, down to the point where uh, the Obama administration has sort of arbitrarily decided that any inhalation of any dust or any soot could kill you anywhere from within hours to decades. You know, I mean, that's the kind of magical pollutant PM 2.5 is. It can kill you at any time. It's like this, it's just sitting in your body waiting to kill you, which is stupid, obviously. Uh, so the, um, when Trump came in, they got new science advisors appointed, and uh, in December 19, 2019, when uh, EPA was reviewing uh, PM 2.5 again, the science advisors looked at the EPA junk science, and in this underlying portion, uh, basically trashed it entirely. So this is a problem for EPA. Um, the Trump review was part of a statutorily required uh, review of PM 2.5. Uh, the Trump EPA didn't do what I would have done, which is roll back all these PM 2.5 regulations entirely and just stop regulating it. Uh, but what they did was they at least they just left it at the Obama level because everybody's gotten used to all the you know industry and states have all gotten used to it. So you know why uh, you know why do the Malloy upheaval? Just leave it as it is. But of course. That is not good enough anymore. So we have, you know, Biden, Biden takes over. What's the first thing the Biden EPA chief does? Well, he fires all the outside science advisors because they, have to, they, they want to regulate, regulate climate through PM 2.5. And now they have the problem of having to recreate all their science because the Trump science advisors have completely trashed 20 years and more than, you know, six or seven hundred million dollars worth of literally science fraud has been exposed and trashed. So now they have, they're faced with the challenge of redoing the 2.5 science and they're, in, and they're doing that now. Now when they restocked their, uh, reconstituted their science advisory panels, they've done it mostly with people that have financial ties to EPA. This is the new CASAC board. It's got seven members, and you can see the chairman has received $60 million in EPA grants. Uh, two other members have received you know, $29 and $35 million worth of grants. These, you know, these panels are the best panels money can buy. These people are going to do EPA's bidding. You know, they're part and parcel of the PM 2.5 fraud. And this is all set up to happen. There is another panel, which is a sub-panel that is meeting right now. To uh, they're working on PM 2.5. Uh, you know, I think it might be 20 members. Um, maybe 15 or 16 of them are EPA grantees. Okay, so the fix is in. Yeah, the fix is in. There's going to be no legitimate review of EPA science. It's just going to be rubber stamping of what EPA wants. Okay, so the, uh, we've got the railroad, we've got the destination, we've got the, the train, the crew, we're all ready to roll. And so what's EPA going to do with this? Well, the current standard for PM 2.5 is 12 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, 
although you know, 21 million people in America live in areas that don't comply with that standard, 93% uh, of that is in California uh, and a couple other places across the country. But you know, the vast majority of America is in full comp compliance. And, and it's not that yeah, that standard means anything anyway, because PM2.5 doesn't hurt anybody at any concentration. Uh, so now EPA is being uh, pressed by its grantee cronies to cut the standard to zero because they, they maintain that there is no safe level of exposure to PM2.5. There is no safe inhalation. I mean, you are all now inhaling lethal amounts of PM2.5, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, EPA may settle on eight micrograms per cubic meter just as a... You know, this is a, a political expedient uh, that will throw much of the country out of compliance with NACs, and that will put EPA in charge of those economies. And um, much of the PM 2.5 in those areas uh, comes out of tailpipes and smokestacks. And guess what? So if you're controlling PM 2.5, what do you do? And you're also controlling CO2 emissions because you're just controlling the use of fossil fuels. So we're in trouble. And this is serious. And when I worked in the coal industry, you know, I worked for the most aggressive coal CEO there was in terms of public policy. I mean, it's the most aggressive person anyway, <laughs> uh, regardless of public policy. And you know, I, it, I, I don't know, maybe it's the words that uh, I just didn't have the right words, but he could not understand how this was going to destroy him and his, and his industry, and it did. Okay, It did. 94% of the uh, market value of the coal industry, his words, gone up in smoke. But, so we need a hero, and um, it's not going to be me, um, but it is going to be a Heartland policy advisor. Uh, Stan Young, Stan Young has, uh, Stan Young is a uh, uh, professional statistician, a PhD in, in statistics. He's worked at the National Institute of Statistical Sciences. Uh, I got Stan interested in air quality about 10 years ago. Um, Stan uh, has done one of the, Stan and, and a couple other people have done one of the, probably the best epidemiologic study uh, on PM 2.5 ever done. Um, and and I, I hate epidemiology. I think it's gar mostly garbage. Uh, but Stan has done the best, you know, piece of garbage possible. And, and it's not garbage. I mean, Stan, Stan looked at every death that happened in California. And California is like the seventh largest economy in the world looked at every death in California from 2000 to 2012. He looked at the death certificates um, and compared that with air, uh, California has some of the best air quality monitoring going on, I mean, to the extent that that's uh, possible. And so Stan, Stan and um, you know, his other all-star uh, statisticians ran 70,000 model runs, did the basic epidemiology, and found of course, as expected, there's no association between 2.5 and premature mortality. Uh, no matter how you slice it, you look at just old people uh, looking at with heart and lung deaths, uh, there is no association. So, so Stan, now, um, Stan was a member of not the Trump administration's KSAC, but a member of another science advisory board called the Science Advisory Board. Uh, and so Stan is one of these people who got fired when the new EPA administrator came in and just cleaned everybody out. Stan reapplied for admission to the boards. Stan is well qualified, <laughs> if nothing else, because he's a very honest guy, and a very great, very smart guy, and very honest guy. Um, and he replied, he applied and was, of course, rejected. Now that gives Stan special status. And two weeks ago, Stan has sued EPA. He sued EPA for uh, you know, unjustly denying him membership to the board and for stacking the board. So this lawsuit is now ongoing. Uh, if Stan succeeds, uh, Stan is asking for uh, all PM work to, be, to stop and for EPA to be forced to reconstitute its boards in a fair and balanced way as is required by law. So I will, this is a new lawsuit. This is the best way, I believe, to stop what EPA is doing. It is ongoing, and it is, is alive, and we'll just have to stay tuned and see what happens. So thank you very much.